it's official, it's been announced, recording is in progress. So thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Robinson. I'm the uh, Global Coordinator of the Housing London Property Area of Responsibility with the Global Protection Cluster. And it's really great to have you here. We're going to get pretty much straight into the agenda uh, because we've got some really fantastic speakers here. Uh, but before we do so, I uh, just want to mention a couple of housekeeping uh, points, many of which you will be familiar with, I'm sure. Um, the first thing is, like I say, we have some great speakers. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the timing and I will be uh, quite ruthless. So uh, please uh, stick to your, your time speakers and we will um, then get to hear from everyone. So please do look for me waving at you if, as, the, as the time moves on. Um, Again, I've mentioned interpretation. If you've just joined since I mentioned that, please choose from French, Arabic, English down at the bottom. Now, we're here to launch the key messages on women, land and peace, uh, about sustaining peace through women's empowerment and increased access to land and property rights in fragile and conflict affected contexts. These messages are available in Arabic and English. And they were developed based on the field experience of, of UN Habitat, of NRC, the Global Land Tool Network, the membership of the HLP AOR, the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility, and all of our, our partners working in fragile and crisis affected contexts. So the messages are a, a, a quick reference and um, they're, they're a short accessible document and we're going to look at those uh, today and hear some great um, cases that exemplify some of the innovative practice relating to those messages. We'll hear key messages and we'll hear examples from uh, Syria and the surrounding countries, Sudan, Tunisia, Egypt and Afghanistan. And we will have uh, a question and answer function. So I'm really pleased to have uh, Jamal Brown, who's the Durable Solutions Officer with UNHCR and Focal Point for Housing, Land and Property, who's with us to help moderate that. Um, and that will be a mixture of uh, using the online chat function um, to submit your questions and then hopefully we'll get to hear the responses from colleagues themselves. I'd like to just say to the speakers, if you see a question directed at you in the chat, please do respond in the chat if you would like to, um, and that will allow us to get as many answers and uh, responses happening as we go. So yes, please do use the chat to submit your questions. If you can direct them to a specific individual, that's really helpful, um, and we will keep a lookout for, for those questions coming in. So the first thing to do is to uh, hear from some esteemed guests who are going to offer us some opening remarks. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, uh, Daniel Valengi, who's the program officer from the Global Programme Food Security with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And he's going to share his opening remarks via a, a video message. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer, UN Habitat and the Global Land Tenure Network, as well as the Arab Land Initiative, to give me this opportunity to address the audience on behalf of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. For Switzerland, equitable land rights, land access for women, as well as gender equality, are among the cornerstone of our development work abroad. Contributing to reduce conflicts and promoting peace are among the highest Swiss interests and completely in line with our foreign policy. In my opinion, the presented document is excellent. It summarizes the importance of protecting women's land and housing rights as a key cornerstone to empower women, improve their lives and sustain peace in fragile contexts. It is my hope that this document will draw the attention on the positive correlation between protecting housing, land and property rights, and promoting peace and stability in fragile contexts. Thank you very much for your attention, and then I wish you a very interesting conference. Thank you for those messages. And uh, yes, uh, uh, pleased to welcome you all those who've joined. Um, you're very welcome. And again, if you need a uh, translation, there's uh, English, Arabic and French available. I'd like out to introduce uh, Frank Samol to give his opening remarks. Frank uh, Samol is the Program Director for Housing, Land and Property Rights with the German Corporation for International Cooperation, or GIZ. 
Uh, Frank Samuel, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. And uh, a very good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I'm joining you from Gaziantep in Turkey and um, very grateful for having the opportunity to say a few words at the opening of this important event. Really looking forward to it. As many of you may know, GIZ is supporting the Global Land Tools Network and also actively participating in it. And uh, with the project that I'm responsible, uh, responsible for, the HLP project working in the context of the Syrian crisis, we are closely collaborating with UN Habitat and NRC in developing, piloting, and rolling out approaches how to strengthen and support women in securing and protecting their HLP rights. So uh, we, I'm really looking forward to uh, some of the practical experience which have hopefully been obtained uh, in the context of our collaboration. Um, and uh, <clears throat> would just like to highlight a few um, um, general uh, uh, issues uh, that are relevant for GIZ's, GIZ's intervention related to gender and uh, gender transformative approaches, which are relevant in most of or almost all our programs and projects due to the immense development potential of gender equality and empowerment. Uh, and the central role of women uh, and gender equality for environmental protection, for mitigation of climate change, but increasingly also for uh, crisis, conflict and disaster, everything related to flight and migration. The focus of GIZ is very much on empowerment um, uh, along three main aspects, gender awareness, better reaching out to women, including them in meetings, trainings, and uh, project activities, being more gender responsive, ensuring that women will actually benefit, e.g., for, for instance, from increased income, uh, but also then be gender transformative, supporting the empowerment of women uh, with regard to control over income, own decision-making, capacity for advocacy. And this is what we also have learned and try to address in our interventions. And I think we will hear many of uh, the relevant issues and challenges in the subsequent key messages. Uh, just to highlight uh, a few challenges, three main challenges that we have faced in, in the context of our interventions. One is the importance of raising the awareness and understanding of women how to protect the HLP rights. Equally important is to improve the scope for women to active, actively participate participate and benefit from initiatives to protect their HLP rights and very important to build capacities of women and organizations for advocacy and lobbying and for uh, legal reform um, and institutional reform. I think many of these issues will come up in the key messages afterwards and we're really looking forward to it and uh, I wish you a very successful uh, launching event of these key messages, which will be highly relevant for our practice in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you for those those messages and highlighting some key parts that are within these uh, key messages as well, both that awareness raising and then doing something to actually support the, the participation and ability of, of women to uh, have increased housing, land and property rights. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hand over now to um, uh, Philippe de Court. He's with UN Habitat as their chief program development of the program development branch, and he's also the interim emergency director. Uh, Philippe, over to you. Oh, thanks, Jim, and, and happy to be here. Uh, and also thanks to, to GIZ and SDC for being active uh, supporters of this kind of work. Uh, I mean, the efforts of the housing and property area of responsibility under the Global Protection, protection Cluster are key. I mean, the advocacy role to take this forward you have is, is important and, and the audience, the size of the audience also shows exactly that uh, that capacity and outreach is, is there. Uh, for UN Habitat, really making sure that we understand these issues and we mobilize the capacities across the network is, uh, is really important. Uh, a couple of years ago, we worked on the Secretary General's guidance notes on land and conflicts, which very importantly tries to see how on these issues we can reach across the humanitarian development 
and peace and security nexus, uh, which this uh, messages also speak to very uh, eloquently. Uh, HLP violations in context affected by crisis are extremely widespread. And I think we still kind of underestimate the importance and the numbers. I mean, 12 million people alone in, uh, in Syria. We also know that, of course, they're becoming increasingly urban, which means they're becoming increasingly complex uh, as issues to deal with and finding, uh, finding solutions. So finding the specialized expertise to craft solutions going forward is something we, we need to map out, we need to uh, mobilize, and we need to kind of really make sure we take our lessons learned going forward. Protection of housing and property rights is definitely has an incredible positive impact on the protection of a number of other human rights protection from violence, uh, reduction of, of gender-based uh, violence, improved livelihoods and food security, uh, and so forth. Now, it's also, of course, uh, and this is what the guidance notes of the Secretary General points out, it's extremely important when we come, when we talk about preventing and reducing the escalation of conflict and facilitating ultimately also return. We know uh, housing, land and property violations are often used as a weapon of war. Uh, they're part of the root causes, but also the drivers and the triggers for further conflicts and the way they are used. Uh, effective HLP rights uh, require really uh, kind of a broad approach, looking at, at land governance, uh, looking at housing issues, the use of land resources, and they're key also to unlock on the positive side, private and public investment for reconstruction. They need to be addressed to be able to move into the recovery phase and uh, reconstruction. Now, that's the only way without addressing those underlying HLP issues, we won't be able to move forward out of fragility into more sustainable development trajectories. Um, finally, the gender dimension, of course, which is key in this particular uh, pr product that is coming out is, uh, is often implied uh, and generally defined, but it's important exactly to zoom in on it because the specific vulnerabilities and, uh, and violations when it comes to, to women is uh, something that worth discussing and highlighting very clearly as these messages have, uh, have done. Um, it's an important contribution to the housing and the property debates uh, and we're sure it's gonna be important not just for the humanitarian community, but also the development and the peace and security community. Uh, big thank you of course to NRC, Minetia and all the others for the partnership on taking this important topic uh, forward and looking forward to the discussions uh, and the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those words, Philippe. And uh, yes, uh, yes, I mean, great to highlight those key key issues that we're looking at uh, today and to mention the, uh, the, the, the networks that we're part of. And I think that's a, a key point to make that um, the, there's the Global Lantel Network and then the membership of the Housing, Land and Property AOR as well. And I just want to uh, open an invitation to all of you here to, uh, to join us and, and uh, come to our, our events, come join and participate. We have different work streams around women's HLP, shelter, um, camp coordination, camp management, and, and increasingly looking at the links between climate change and HLP as well. So you'd be very welcome, as, as Philippe says, to help us build those connections between the humanitarian and the development and the peace uh, actors. Um, so yeah, thank you for those words. And um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Ombretta. Um, she's going to uh, take us through the, the key messages and introduce our, our speakers. And uh, just one last moment to mention again, translation is available at the bottom. Choose the globe and you can select Arabic, French or English. Uh, so please do that. We have people speaking in a number of different languages uh, today. And um, if you have questions, comments, please do uh, put those in the chat and we will be looking at those uh, later and uh, getting some responses. So Ombretta is the uh, Ombretta Tempra is the Human Settlements Officer and Land Specialist with UN Habitat and the Global Land Tool Network. I'm really pleased to uh, introduce and hand over to Ombretta, who will take us through the messages. Ombretta, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jim, um, and thank you everybody for joining this important discussion and to to attend this launch. Um, it's been uh, a, a a good effort to try to consolidate the, the knowledge that exists on the topic in a document of six pages, 
but we find this was a, an important effort exactly in the, in the tentative of reaching out uh, with the juice of this uh, content, a broader audience. Uh, this very short set of messages uh, are divided in four areas. Uh, uh, why it is important to protect women's uh, housing, land, and property rights, particularly in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Uh, secondly, how, the how to, to do so, how to increase the recognition and the protection of these rights. And we'll have here a case study uh, on display Syrian women presented by NRC, who has done a lot of work on this aspect. Thirdly, we look at how uh, to empower and increase women's participation in processes related to land management and HLP rights overall. And we'll have here a supporting case from FAO uh, uh, from Sudan. And lastly, uh, some messages on how to look at this uh, topic across the humanitarian peace and development nexus. Uh, we have three experiences uh, from the Tunisian government. Uh, from a grassroots women organization operating in Tunisia and Egypt, and then uh, an experience from Afghanistan, where UN Habitat has one of its largest operations exactly on HLP rights. Uh, I think the, the, the scope and the objective of messages was already uh, introduced, uh, but we would like really to encourage all of you to use this these messages in your own uh, work uh, to develop advocacy with your own stakeholders, but also to develop programs and mainstream this theme in existing uh, intervention that your organization might already have in fragile uh, countries, in conflict affected countries, or in countries that might be prone to fall into conflict. So it's really a tool for you to, uh, to use and uh, do feel free to reach out to ourselves, the HLP, AOR, UNHCR, NRC at the field level and globally if you need more guidance. Um, the first section, as I was mentioning, my, uh, talks about why it is important. Uh, this is, is really useful for, um, for advocacy. Um, the, the, reason, the first aspect we want, the messages highlight is that women are recognized to play a key role in preventing and resolving conflicts and building and sustaining peace in their communities, in their country. So they, have, they act as peace agent. This role is often not recognized, uh, but it's been there. And, uh, and uh, we encourage also uh, in the messages to document that further. Uh, but secure, when we secure women's HLP rights, we enable women to play this role with more uh, success. Because they, if they feel safe in their communities and their HLP rights are protected, uh, they have an increased uh, capacity to play this role of peace agent more effectively and to participate in the various peace processes that can take place, uh, such as peace negotiation and various peace building actions. Secondly, uh, protecting women's HLP rights, as well as men, of course, HLP rights has an overall stabilizing effect on the society. Uh, it helps uh, mitigating the risk of violent conflicts to flare up. It enables, as was mentioned in the opening remarks, the realization of a broader uh, range of human rights, which are all interconnected. It also increases agricultural productivity and food security and overall helps societies to move out of the vulnerability towards recovery and self-reliance. Uh, very important when countries try to emerge from conflict. The protection of housing, land and property rights is also a key component of the social pact between the citizens and the states, and therefore as an important peace building uh, and state building function that uh, fragile conflict or co countries uh, co context emerging from conflict need. Uh, overall, HLP rights uh, are contributing significantly to the protection of women in a conflict affected context and fragile context. Because when women have housing, land, and property rights, uh, they are better protected, their vulnerabilities are reduced. They are a step closer to realizing their right to equality in general. 
the powers relation within the household and within the community are rebalanced, their autonomy and self-determination increases, and they are better capable to provide for themselves on, and their families, uh, coping with the social economic impacts of conflict. Uh, they're also, um, you know, uh, somehow pushed less into adopting negative uh, and risky behavior to cope with the, with the results of the crisis. So somehow overall it reduced women's vulnerability. For all these reasons, uh, uh, you know, it's important to address the topic. Let's move now to the how. Uh, how to increase the recognition and protection of women HLT rights. Um, what has proven effective? The first point might seem quite obvious, but uh, it's often not. <laughs> uh, so it's important to actually assess and identify which tenure options are more suitable to address this issue. Looking at the time, the scale, the sustainability, the capacity of putting them in, in place, what would be the acceptance by local actors to choose a particular housing, land and property rights solution versus another? Uh, and what is the capacity of the solution we choose to reach a larger number of women in a shorter time period, why perhaps more sustainable long and medium term options are looked out. So let's scope out and, and choose better our battles when we start to engaging in this topic and then um, uh, move from there. It's also very crucial to remove legal and administrative blockages that prevent displaced women uh, or women in conflict to. Uh, from using, renting, and owning housing, land, and properties. Often, um, you know, people and women are able to fend for themselves, to find solution for themselves, if only some of those uh, administrative and legal blockages that exist are eased. And the international community has a big role in that. Uh, of course, we can promote uh, and broker uh, recording clear and fair housing, land, and property arrangements like the tenancy agreements that can be individual or group rights. So the brokering agreements between those who offer uh, um, housing and land and properties to women and actually the beneficiaries themselves is a role that, uh, that helps a lot in securing uh, and protecting HLP rights to a large number of women and their family uh, in a relatively easy way and small period of time. Uh, advocating and supporting the issue or reissuing civil documentation is crucial. Civil documentation is very tightly related to the protection of housing, land and property rights. We'll hear a lot about that. This is a very important point. Uh, and then it's also obviously important to support the retrieval or reissue or protecting the HLP documents that women and their family might have. Uh, there are Few other issues I'll mention them briefly. Uh, establishing information and support center in the communities is important because we need to reach out to those in need and the closer we are to them with our partner, the better. Providing legal counseling and assistance also in resolving HLP disputes is very important. Uh, NRC and other partners have done a lot of work on that and is still a key intervention in this area. Uh, we need to ensure that women are empowered to participate in these various processes and not only be seen as beneficiaries. Collecting, analyzing uh, gender disaggregated data on HLP is of course important for advocacy, but also to put the spotlight on the issue. Um, and then uh, a couple of other points that uh, you know the, 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 the guidelines also mention, uh, but for the sake of time, I would like at this point actually to move to the um, who the example that is presented uh, that supports uh, that gives some uh, you know uh, visual and, and more concrete example on this first set of messages, and it's my real pleasure to introduce uh, Laura Kunial, the ICLA uh, research advisor from the Norwegian Refugee Council, and Sherin Alabdalla, durable solution officer uh, in Syria, also from the Norwegian Refugee Council that will talk about um, uh, displaced Syrian women, HLP rights, challenges and opportunities. 
Thank you, Ombreta. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Shirin. We are actually joining you today from Amman, where we are having our regional uh, workshop. And one of the topics in the agenda is, in fact, how to continue to promote Syrian women access to housing, land, and property rights. So it's really uh, timely to launch these uh, wonderful messages that we very much look forward to use in our advocacy efforts, but also in our uh, engagement with uh, displaced Syrian women. So uh, moving to the next slides, I just wanted to uh, start my presentation uh, with one point, one really slides on the situation that Syrian women face. Uh, NRC has done quite extensive research on this issue, but here I put today the quote, and I know it's only in Arabic, I'm gonna say it in English now, from a Syrian uh, woman that we interview in Lebanon. So this is a refugee in Lebanon, because I think that she summarized the challenges that we, Syrian women face better than I would be able to do. She says that the main issue that Syrian women face are related to housing, land and property rights from an inheritance perspective, lack of information concerning legal procedure, lack of financial mean, for example, uh, to require to hire a lawyer, and then the fact that most of the property documents in Syria are registered under the male name, the husband name, and therefore women name do not appear in the document. And she says very well that her name doesn't appear in the property document that she and her husband, in fact, their late husband, had in Syria. And this is, of course, a huge uh, problem for her in terms of being able to prove uh, the property that she owned uh, back in Syria. But uh, now, with these uh, um, challenges, uh, the work that is being done at the moment, and we can move to the next slides, really cut across uh, um, multiple efforts at regional level. So uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council is present uh, in Syria, throughout Syria, so in government control area, opposition control area, as well as uh, Kurdish control area, and then also in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, which are hosting a large number of refugees. So across the border, really, we've seen uh, an effort looking at promoting uh, women access to uh, property and how to protect uh, uh, the women uh, property rights. And this is uh, primarily uh, around legal aid programming. So of course, NRC ran a large legal aid programming uh, in all the country uh, and activities include um, legal awareness sessions. So raising awareness on rights and responsibility, but also targeted counseling and also targeted uh, legal assistant. Uh, that really looks at housing, land and property rights. But as you said very well, uh, Ombretta before, also looks at civil documentation because civil documentation is a requirement for the enjoyment of housing, land and property rights. And very often, for example, in the refugee population, uh, a lot can be done today to ensure that these women have marriage document, have all their family document, have, for example, in case of divorce or the death of their husband or when the husband is missing, have the documentation to prove the whereabouts of their husband, the death certificate, uh, the missing uh, husband certificate, all of these documents, because these documents will be needed if and when they will be able to claim uh, their property uh, back in Syria. So a lot of efforts really also on civil documentation as a requirement for the enjoyment of property rights. And then this is complemented by uh, capacity building efforts uh, with the community, in particular with uh, refugee women active in the community, but also a legal practitioner, uh, um, refugee who have a legal background to really uh, look at the legal framework in Syria, but then also uh, discuss with them and understand what are the barriers that women face and how can we uh, support them in uh, overcoming these barriers. And the barriers, as, as I put uh, very well in my first slides, are not linked to uh, the law, but is actually the customs and the norms that really uh, create barriers to uh, the enjoyment. Um, we have uh, um, developed a number of tools and material that is being used, but uh, what we wanted to uh, present today uh, is um, um, a booklet uh, that uh, covers stories of housing, land and property rights for Syrian women. And I will give the floor to my colleague Shirin, who's right here next to me. 
and she will also speak in Arabic. So if you want to put uh, the Arabic interpretation is the right time. Hello, everyone. I'm Shireen Abdallah. I'm from Syria Country Office, Drogo Solution Officer. Um, yeah, as Laura said, please, you can proceed with the English because I'm going to talk to you in, in Arabic. Um, عطفا على ما تحدثت عنه السيدة لورا وانطلاقا من أهمية رفع التوعية للمرأة فيما يتعلق بحقوق الأرض والسكن والملكية ولما هذه الحقوق من أهمية للمرأة ولا سيما في حال تفكك هذه الأسرة أو الانفصال أو الوفاة كما ذكرت سابقا في حالة اللاجئة السورية أو في حالة الوفاة الزوج أو, أو أحد الأقارب التي ازدادت جميعها في آخر آونة خلال النزاع لذلك قمنا بجمع خمس قصص حقيقية ترويها نساء سوريات من معظم المناطق السورية كان الهدف من هذه القصص هو تسليط الضوء على تجارب هذه النساء التي كانت بكلماتهم واقتباساتهم لأنهم قاموا بالتحدث عن الكفاح الطويل والصعب للحصول على حقوقهم في الملكية إذ أن حقوق الأرض والسكن والملكية تساهم بشكل أساسي في تمكين المرأة وزيادة إحساسها بالأمان وضمان مشاركتها في بناء مستقبلها ومستقبل عائلتها Next step please توضح هذه القصص أنه بالرغم من أن بعض القوانين السورية المتعلقة بحقوق الملكية متحيزة تجاه الرجال إلا أنها تعترف بحق المرأة في الملكية وتضع قواعد للميراث كان عن طريق الشريعة أو قوانين الأحوال الشخصية المختلفة بالرغم من وجود هذه الحماية إلا أن العادات والتقاليد أخفلتها منذ فترة طويلة وكانت النتائج هي حرمان النساء من حقوقهم في الميراث وحقوقهم الأخرى في الأرض والسكن والملكية كما أن ممكن أن توضح هذه القصص التي اختارت كما هو واضح أشجار العائلة المدرجة معها وكيف تم تناقل هذه الممارسات التمييزية من جيل إلى آخر وكيف أدت هذه الظروف الناجمة عن الأزمة في سوريا إلى تفاقم الكثير من هذه الممارسات التي أدت إلى تخلي نساء عن حقوقهم هذه القصص تم إنتاجها على شكل فيديوهات وقصص مطبوعة يتم مناقشتها من خلال جلسات التوعية التي نقدمها والتدريبات المخصصة لجميع النساء السوريات النساء السوريات التي يبحثن عن مكان يدعى منزل يطالبنا بحقوقهن وحقوق أطفالهن في البقاء والبحث عن الاستقلالية من خلال ملكية عقار أو منزل وأيضا توجه رسائل لجميع الرجال الذين يقومون بخطوات لضمان تمتع زوجاتهن وأطفالهن بحقوق السكن والأرض والملكية وشكرا Thank you, Shaheen. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Um, and uh, definitely, uh, there is a lot more information you can find on different on these projects, also on the NRC web pages. Um, we are looking now uh, at the third section of messages, uh, which is how to empower and increase women participation in processes related to land management and housing, land and property rights. Uh, so we see that this is a two-way connection. So the protection of women's HLP rights is a precondition to ensure that uh, women do participate and uh, in increase participation in processes. But at the same time, it's important to ensure that there is uh, that women are empowered to participate in these discussions that sometimes are perceived as uh, too technical or complicated to engage with uh, already for experts, uh, for uh, even more so for communities or, uh, or um, men and women or you know, illiterate uh, uh, people in general or people with less technical knowledge that, uh, that in their minds, their confidence to participate in these processes. Uh, further, you know, there are discriminating uh, gender roles and social norms that create an additional blockage. So to ensure that actually um, this is overcome and women do participate in uh, processes related to housing, land and property rights and land management overall, um, uh, it's important really to focus also on their empowerment. Uh, these processes are uh, of different nature. 
uh, and in these areas is where uh, women participation and empowerment are particularly needed. Uh, this takes the shape of uh, negotiation and mediation efforts related to access to use of and control over land and land related resources. Uh, they include land dispute resolution processes. Um, they include the participation in commissions that are related to land that can be land commissions. We see that in conflict affected countries very often land commissions are established. It's important that women are represented. Uh, but also commissions that deal with return and restitution, for example, that don't per se look at land issues, but where land and HLP issues are a key component of the discussions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, in peace agreements, uh, we see that increasingly, uh, actually, basically in the last decades, almost the totality of peace agreements do have provisions related to land and HP. Sometimes these provisions are not sufficiently unpacked or well described, but they are there because they are a key issue, a root cause of conflict. Uh, so it's important that women are represented in peace agreements so that their interests and needs are reflected, but also because it's proven that if women participate in the development of peace agreements, those peace agreement, agreements are more likely to be implemented and to translate into reality and overall uh, support the pacification uh, of the societies. Uh, this also prepares the ground for women involvement in broader land and HLP discussion, discussions during the recovery and reconstruction phase, so after the emergency per se. So to promote this empowerment and participation, it's important to raise women's awareness and understanding of HLP issues so they are confident in taking part in this discussion, support the inclusion of women in reconstruction and rehabilitation processes, uh, strengthen their capacity, but also the capacity of women's association to engage in these processes. Uh, make this a requirement, not a decision, but a precondition. Uh, and uh, uh, make sure that the data, the information that is collected is gender disaggregated, because that will make a case also for representing those interests and needs. Uh, and overall, uh, this again along the peace and development nexus that we'll see better later on, support women employment in, uh, in uh, jobs that are related to land, such, land, such, such as land administration, uh, which are often perceived as a man only type of work. Um, to unpack this dimension, we'll hear now the example of uh, Sudan presented by FAO. So it's my pleasure to introduce now Abdirahman Isaac, the Chief Technical Officer of FAO Sudan. Uh, Abdirahman, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. You have covered already all the issues that I wanted actually to say, but uh, just to be on time, um, in Sudan, land is a social, uh, economic and political resources, which is intrinsically linked to issue of access, use and control that requires the governance structure. And uh, about, if you just give you um, um, an understanding about Darfur, like 98% of the land is under customary institutions. Customary institutions are not recognized legally by the, by the constitution of the country. And uh, so they are not uh, legally registered or customarily registered. So therefore they lack the tenor security by, by itself. So once it's not registered, it's not recognized by the, 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 the legal system, then it's not uh, secure. So these governance structures that exist in Darfur, which is a customary system, is male dominated with patriarchal perception, where women does not have a place. Women can only be uh, represented by their fathers or husbands or the, their sons in accessing land and using land. So, um, so the legality aspect of it, when I just look into the legality aspect of it, 
the, league, the, the law does not discriminate between men and women. But then <laughs> it does not explicitly uh, determine equal rights. So it actually, the, the law actually put it in a vague way where it does not uh, determine equal rights for men and women. So women's rights to access, use and control land is not directly recognized by the customary system and it's not protected by the legal system. So um, please go to slide two. So we try to implement a European Union funded project in 20 localities and five return sites. Return sites are areas that uh, I internally displaced people actually go back the original land. So that's what we call return sites. So uh, we try to secure agricultural land, land rights of women through increase, I mean, through registration, formal registration to increase both productivity from men and women. And so what we did was we actually engendered the whole concept of the process of land registration. So a woman and a man have to consent together. I mean, a husband and a, and, and a wife or wives have to consent together to register the land formally. And then the registration actually documents come with all the names of the, of the, of the wives or wife plus the husband. So to ensure that once there is a divorce, the woman will not be able to be left out to actually get her rights because the land is registered under, under her name. So similarly, we, because here is people actually marry more than two, I mean, one wife. So we do for all the wives, legally married wives in the, by, by, by the husband. So, um, and then we try to actually uh, make representations, like representations, at least certain percentage, so that women are represented in all coordination structures through the implementation of the project at state level, at regional level and at locality level where women are being represented. And then in the land registration, we managed to actually register like 114 female headed households in, in return sites, four return sites. And, and, uh, and then we also supported them economically by actually providing them with uh, uh, grain, uh, grain mills and oil pressing machines and, you know, knapsack sprayers and also uh, water pumps for, for, for doing irrigation. Uh, so basically, um, when, 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 the, when the governance structure, well, what we have seen is when governance structure or the customary governance structure disproportionately discriminates land rights of men and women, imbalances on access to land, uh, use and control of land resources subdues the potential of the, of, 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 uh, uh, the potential of, of men and women in, in the long term. And, uh, and actually brings a dominance of one group over the other. So to break this barrier, we had to actually enforce representations. And uh, so, I mean, we were trying to actually come from FAO perspective where we use the voluntary guidelines to guide us on how to, to achieve this. So what we find out that if women are institutionally represented and empowered to have a say in the power structure where they can have access rights, user rights and control rights actually uh, life will be, will be much better. And we have seen that it also, I mean, uh, gives uh, better productivity because the, the, it unpacks the potential of women and household nutrition actually substanti substantially increased because once women have access to resources, particularly agricultural resources, the household nutrition is, is improved and also the environment. Men are the ones who actually clear the land for, 
for, for, for, for, for different purposes, for charcoal, for, for construction. But women, we have seen that women are the growers of life, and including plants. Next, please. So this is some of the photos that we have, we can actually share with you where they have, we have given them uh, palms to irrigate their lungs. And uh, so some of the recommendations that I can actually want to present with you is the legal reforms are required to explicitly engender women rights. This is mandatory. If the, the legal constitutions do not protect the right of women, and then the customary systems don't even recognize their rights, they will be left out. The other thing is promote inclusion of women in the council of institution decision making. That is, so far now, from this project, we actually had some uh, success stories where women become part of the decision makers in the customary systems. And they actually make better decisions than men who, who dominate the entire uh, uh, governance structure of, of land. And then we managed to uh, help support uh, Sudan to establish an Institute of Land Tenor Governance in the University of Khartoum. So we have an institute already working. We developed the curriculums, both undergraduate and, uh, and masters. And we expect women to be actually enrolling in this institute so that they can actually have enough sufficient knowledge and, uh, and, and skills to claim for their rights. And uh, I will leave you there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abdirahman. This was a very, um, very interesting example and very um, congratulations actually for this, this work. Uh, we know that operating in, in, in Sudan at the moment is quite challenging, uh, but a lot of advances have been made uh, in this area of work and uh, indeed um, you know, also working on customary decision making um, processes is crucial to 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 achieve the the goals. Uh, and and actually, surprisingly, um, it's uh, sometimes it works uh, perhaps better on the short term than than, uh, than we would expect. Uh, let's now look at the last section of the messages. Uh, which is uh, focused, uh, it looks at beyond actually the humanitarian phase by itself, looks at uh, women's housing, land and property rights for conflict prevention and recovery, therefore along the humanitarian development peace nexus or continuum. Uh, so this is where also the durable uh, solution uh, perspective comes in uh, and the longer term recovery uh, strategies. Uh, so what needs to be done, basically, before the conflict uh, escalate, uh, overall also in developing context and also during the emergency, but also as country emerges uh, and goes towards stabilization, hopefully. We also know that, um, you know, when land issues are addressed, because they are some of the root causes of conflict, the countries are less likely to keep falling back in the cycle of conflict. Uh, so it's really important to look at these issues, not only uh, for humanitarian uh, relief uh, scope, which is obviously very needed and very important, but also uh, on the longer perspective. Uh, advocacy remains very important, um, but we see that protecting women, housing, land and property rights is, uh, must take place uh, in a more structured way. It's important, for example, to protect women's inheritance right. This is a key moment where women actually tend to lose their housing, land and property rights, even though national laws might be in place that actually uh, prevent that. But we see that this is an area where um, uh, male dominated or gender discriminatory practices tend to take uh, over, uh, over the national laws and international, of course, laws. Um, also important to prevent protect women's housing, land, and property rights at the time of a marriage. Marriage is the moment where the land and property regime within the family gets defined and redefined, and it's therefore important that marriage contracts are registered and that land and property provisions are included. And this is 
something that in many country is is available as a um, you know as an option when uh, contracting marriage is to define the land and property regime of the couple getting married at that time this is not sufficiently known uh, and we see that is a key opportunity to strengthen women uh, housing land and property rights uh, Providing practical support remains important because we see that a lot of times uh, legislations uh, do not prevent women from accessing rights, but is actually the practice and the practical obstacle that impede women, uh, the enjoyment of that right uh, in real life. So uh, there is a range, of course, of tools to do so. Uh, we are not going into detail into, into these at the moment. Um, but is really the support that's needed at the grassroots level, at the community level. Uh, increasing women access to justice and dispute resolution mechanisms uh, overall, not only in crisis that we saw before, uh, but overall making these uh, institutions uh, more uh, uh, accessible to women uh, in terms of, you know, the courts and dispute resolution mechanisms, uh, formal and customary or religious, but also land administration. Um, land administration needs to be more gender ac accessible to women, more gender friendly. Um, increasing women access to credit overall is important for women to be able to purchase uh, if, if they want housing uh, or land. Um, of course, there are cases where, in fact, there are gender discriminatory norms that exist in constitution, policies or laws, and we need to call for an amendment for, of that uh, when possible, when feasible. This is obviously not necessarily in the emergency phase, but overall the revision of some of these uh, legislative instruments might be needed. Uh, lastly, uh, it is important to learn to work in context where there is legal pluralism, because we see that, of course, in many countries, uh, and particularly when the institutions fail during conflict or in fragile countries, um, the state institutions uh, um, are operating in uh, uh, parallel with the regional uh, institution, customary institution, as we saw in the case of Sudan. So it is important to understand this complexity and to see how to work in this context without undermining the formal uh, institution or the national legislation, but also to achieve gains in the short term in the humanitarian phase, but uh, sustaining the overall longer term engagement uh, for development that are more maybe uh, sustainable in development or in the long term. So I'm concluding now the short presentation of the messages, uh, presenting, basically condensing the literature on this topic and the field experience in six, six pages was already challenges. To further condense this in the presentation was even more challenging. So you'll find a lot more information in the document, but I would like now to give the floor to the three speakers that give some example to this last point. Um, I will start by introducing the first one, uh, which uh, is uh, Ms. Najwa Ben Kamla, the Director of Investment Unit and Special Representative of the Council of Peers at the Ministry of State, Property and Land Affairs in Tunisia. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just quickly mention the other two and then we will hand over the floor to them later on. Uh, the second one will be uh, Ms. Rasha Ahmad Eldin, Executive Director of the Bena Foundation, um, which is, uh, uh, will present the case of Tunisia and Egypt. And lastly, we'll have Anthony Lamba, Chief of Party of City for All Program uh, at UN Habitat Afghanistan that will ex present the experience from, from that context. So to start with, over to you, Ms. Najwa. Vous avez la parole. Shukra lakum ma'ala l'istidafa. Awalan, hikaya tul... حكاية المرأة والأرض والسلم بدأت في تونس مع عليسا مؤسسة قرطاج وبدأت بامتلاكها جلد ثور تمكنت من حكم شمال إفريقيا بتجاربها الواسعة وسيطرت على البحر الأبيض المتوسط ليعم الأمن والسلم 
السلم والأمن والسلام لقد بلغت المرأة التونسية درجة متقدمة من التمكين التشريعي والحقوقي والمؤسساتي إلى التمكين الاقتصادي وهو خيار تشريعي انتهجته تونس للتقليص من الهوة بين الجنسين بمقتضى دستورها والتزاماتها الدولية والآليات التي من شأنها القضاء على جميع أشكال التمييز لا أخفي عليكم سوف أسرد بعض القوانين التي هناك أرجوكم الصفحة الثالثة من أول هذا التكريس القانوني والتشريع والحقوقي بدأ مع إلغاء قانون العبودية سنة 1946 ثم مع إلغاء تعدد الزوجات إلى جانب إلغاء نظام الأوقاف كنظام ضد حق الملكية في حد ذاته وبدأ المساواة بين المواطنين والمواطنات في الحقوق والواجبات بدون أي تمييز كذلك قانون 1998 المتعلق بنظام الاشتراك في الأملاك بين الزوجين وهو نظام اختياري رضائي عند إبرام عقد الزواج ولا يخفى على الجميع أن المبدأ في الشريعة الإسلامية أو في الأنظمة الإسلامية يقوم على التفرقة في الأملاك والملكية ولكن تونس انتهجت هذا الخيار التشريعي كذلك لا يخفى على الجميع أن تونس الأولى من حيث سنها لقانون القضاء على العنف ضد المرأة سنة 2017 وكذلك شهدت المنظومة المؤسساتية بإحداث هياكل تعنى بتحقيق هذه المساواة سيما في إحداث مجلس النظراء وهو مجلس يحدث لدى السيد رئيس الحكومة يسهر على تنفيذ الخطط الوطنية لإدراج مقاربة النوع الاجتماعي كذلك من بين المؤسسات هناك المرصد الوطني لمناهضة العنف كذلك مركز يعنى بالبحوث والدراسات والتوفيق حول المرأة كذلك تونس انتهجت نحو مأسسة مقاربة النوع الاجتماعي وإنتماجها بمخطط الخماسي وبقانون الحق الموالية انخرطت وسوف نحكي على الواقع التونسي انخرطت تونس إلى التزاماتها وتعهداتها الدولية حيث صادقت في 2018 على الخطة الوطنية لتنفيذ قرار مجلس الأمن المتعلق 1325 والمتعلق بإحداث خطة وطنية وأربعة قطاعية تعنى بتنمية المناطق الحدودية المهددة بالإرهاب وذلك بتمكين النساء من ضعف مشاريع فلاحية في ذلك المجال في إطار سلسلة القيمة ومبادئ الاقتصاد التضامني والاجتماعي كذلك مولت البنوك التونسية وبرنامج تمكنت عدته وزارة شؤون المرأة والأسرة التونسية اسمه برنامج رائدات مكن من تأسيس تعزيز النساء في بعض مشاريع اقتصادية صغيرة ومتوسطة حوالي تم تمويل 4703 عشر مشروع موجه بأن نسبة مشاركة المرأة في العمل الفلاحي تعد 62% لكن تصدم بالواقع فإن الأحصائية تدل على أن 6% فقط من أصحاب المشاريع الفلاحية يتحصلن على شهائد ملكية وذلك لعدة أسباب أهمها شرط الضمان أحيانا الحرمان من ميراث في بعض المناطق القليلة جدا في تونس كذلك عدة الدولة برنامج وخاصة وزارة أملاك الدولة وشؤون العقارية في تشجيع صاحبات الشهائد العليا تمكينهم من مقاسم فلاحية نسبة مشاركة المرأة 40% تمكينهم خاصة في المشاريع ذات المناطق التنمية الجهوية لا يخفى على الجميع أن نسبة الطالبات المعدات في المجال الفلاحي تعد 75% كذلك تمكنت 73% من الفتيات أصحاب مشاريع فلاحية مولتها الدولة التونسية بقيمة 250 ألف دينار. كذلك قامت وزارة أملاك الدولة والشؤون العقارية بتمكين متصرفين ومتصرفات عقارات دولية من عقود تمليك وهي مساحة على سبيل الذكر تم إبرام 362 عقد تتوزع على مساحة 17 ولاية كذلك في المجال الغير فلاحي مكنت الدولة التونسية من برنامج تسوية تسوية لتجمعات سكنية لفائدة النساء العاملات لفائدة النساء والرجال على حد السواء تمكنت النساء من حوالي نسبة تمليكهن بالربع في ونسبة التسوية ما زالت سارية إلى حد الآن كذلك تقوم الدولة بتوفير سكن اجتماعي لذوي الحيطة الاجتماعية 52 هكتار 
ثم في الجزء الأخير سوف نتحدث عن التحديات على الرغم من الترسانة من القوانين والمؤسسات التي إلا هناك الواقع هناك بعض العوائق القانونية مثلا أن المؤشرات الكمية والنوعية تحيل إلى وجود بعض الفجوات النوعية المتفاوضة مما يجعل المرأة لا تتحصل على حق التمليك وهذا راجع لطبيعة النصوص القانونية التي تنظم العقار الدولي إن الولوج إلى العقار الدولي يخضع لمبدأ المساواة والمنافسة والإشهار وهنا لا بد من المراجعة القانونية لتمكين هؤلاء العاملات في المجال الريفي لتمكينهن من من الامتيازات العقارية والمالية إلى غير ذلك كذلك ما رد هذا النسبة في ضعف التمليك هو ضعف الاعتمادات المالية المرصودة وهو ما يتطلب رؤية استشرافية شاملة لمحاور التنمية الاجتماعية والاقتصادية تنفذ عبر سياسات عمومية ضمانا للمساواة بين الفئات والجهات كذلك هنا الأفاق أو الرسائل التي يمكن بعضها أثبتت المرأة الريفية التونسية خاصة مع جائحة كورونا بكونها ركيزة أساسية للأمن الغذائي في تونس فهي مورد حيوي فهي غير ذلك فحان الوقت لسن تشريعات مناسبة لتفعيل آليات التمويل كذلك تمكينها من إقامة مشاريع في المجال الزراعي مع مراعاة خصوصية العمل الزراعي خاصة في الجنوب التونسي ذلك إمكانية إطار قانوني إدماج العاملات بالشكل الغير الرسمي في القطاع الرسمي كذلك اعتماد مقاربة الاستثمار المراعي للنوع الاجتماعي وذلك بمزيد إقرار التشجيعات والحوافز المالية والعقارية للباعثات وأصحاب المشاريع المنتصبة خاصة في الجنوب والمناطق الصحراوية والمهمشة والأكثر فقرا كذلك لابد من دعم ميزانيات الإدارات العمومية لاعتماد المؤشرات الكمية والنوعية والمراعية للنوع الاجتماعي نذكر على سبيل المثال يوجد الديوان الوطني للملكية العقارية وهو يعمل على ضمان حق الملكية وترسيمه إلا أنه لتقديم مؤشرات لا بد من اعتماد مؤشرات جندرية وهو هناك عوائق مالية تمنعه من تمكيننا من هذه الأحصائيات في الأخير أقول لكم في إطار ضمان تشريك المرأة لابد من المراجعة القانونية المصحوبة بالمراجعة الثقافية والمزيد من التحسيس بضرورة تمليك النساء وتشريكهن في في عمليات الحفاظ على الأمن والبناء السلام المستدام فلا سلام دون نساء وشكرا Thank you so much, Ms. Nagwa, for the presentation. And um, I am handing over now uh, to uh, the executive director of the Bena Foundation, Ms. Rasha Mat El Din. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Roberta, for having us. Uh, first of all, let me introduce the uh, Bena Foundation. Bena is an NGO based in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, we started uh, since 2015, uh, aiming at developing and uh, aiming at developing and transferring knowledge, uh, building the capacity of women, youth, and kids, uh, with a special focus in rural uh, areas. Um, as one of our next slide, please. As one of our main uh, target is building the capacity of women in rural areas. We made a lot of. Uh, we made a lot of research to came uh, up with the problem that facing the rural uh, women in order to improve their lives and uh, to empower them. One of the main problems was her right in obtaining the land and inheritance. As according to a uh, Brevilian uh, tradition in society, Egyptian women suffered from the provision of inheritance. When a woman obtained her legal rights to inheritance, she became the talk of the hour in the villages and town. In many Arab countries, especially in rural uh, areas, land, uh, land are seen as wealth and honor, and men control, men control uh, the land. Uh, they uh, prevent uh, their sisters from uh, inherit in, in, in land as well. In many cases, the reason for withholding the inheritance from the woman is the father himself, uh, who relinquished his property to his male children as he saw that uh, the man will help to grow, uh, to grow it up and keep it, uh, and keep it uh, in a state of, uh, of woman. Uh, even the wife, uh, even his wife who shared her life with him may not receive her uh, a share of inheritance after the death of the husband. So uh, next slide, please. 
So as a result of that, we uh, collaborate uh, with um, uh, uh, Tunisian organizations uh, and, and experts from uh, Egypt and uh, Tunisia as well uh, to try to overcome uh, the problem that faces a woman in, uh, in Egypt and to command the challenges a uh, woman face in obtaining the right and uh, inheriting in post care. Uh, our project is mainly uh, based on building the capacity of women in the rural villages. We, we are focusing in a village called Al Jahtam in Al Sud uh, Governorate. Uh, we try to uh, build the knowledge of heritage laws and how to claim and take the rise and open new pathways for them uh, for economic empowerment, which will lead to improve uh, their financial, financial situation and support their ability to claim their rights. Our project uh, is funded by uh, UN Habitat and DMZ, uh, and it's, it's tackled as strong uh, questions. Uh, the question is focuses or focuses of how does uh, social culture influence the rule of law in matters of land uh, of land inherited in the Arab regions. Next slide, please. Uh, in the past weeks, we finished uh, the first phase of the project in Egypt. Uh, it was uh, two days of uh, capacity uh, study tools and capacity development for uh, rural uh, women. Uh, we came up with some uh, results. One of these results is women gain knowledge of inheritance law uh, inside Egypt, uh, the legal ways and process that must be followed uh, when claiming the right to inheritance came up with uh, ideas and a proposal for the project that enabled them to improve their economic situation and network among themselves to implement this project, which will positively affect their lives and their ability uh, to, to make decisions. Um, the overall uh, impact from the project will be a documentary uh, that document uh, the stories uh, on uh, the stories telling by women uh, voices, um, on uh, the command that the, the challenges that they face uh, to obtain the rights in uh, land, as well as a policy paper containing recommendations and strategy uh, to overcome uh, to overcome the problem faces uh, by women to inherit land in Arab uh, regions, uh, and after and after. Um, and, uh, and after we finish uh, the project, we hope uh, that uh, it take uh, a good, uh, uh, it, it bring a good result. And we believe, uh, in the end of our presentation, finally, we believe that for building a good, a strong, sustainable community, uh, we have to help women uh, to get uh, the rights. And this will not uh, happen uh, unless we separate awareness and education and this is a must uh, to lead, uh, to empower women in rural places. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasha, for this presentation that uh, exactly talks to the to role of empowering the women themselves uh, to take up uh, these, uh, these streams of work more directly and with more knowledge of the, the topics itself. I think it's a, it's a very, um, interesting example and we look forward to see what will come out of this uh, this collaboration Thank um, you so much. and the last but not least uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Anthony Lamba um, to talk uh, about the Afghanistan uh, case Anthony you have the floor thank you very much you can hear me very uh, slow uh, very Okay. Yeah. Now better. Yeah, yeah. It's better now. Okay. Yes. The microphone was far. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, discuss a very large program that we've just delivered in Afghanistan. Uh, this was a six year program that uh, closed at the end of last year. So December last year, the city for all program, a national program uh, that focused on three areas. One was property uh, rights, access to property rights for uh, urban residents. Uh, second was municipal finance. So after people get uh, their rights to the properties that they occupy, it's, uh, it was useful for the program then to 
uh, bring them into the register for paying municipal charges or property tax. And the third area was uh, the people who now have uh, better security of tenure uh, could be brought to form what we called Goza assemblies. These are neighborhood assemblies and they sat in these assemblies and were used for many development uh, initiatives uh, where women uh, formed the Goza assemblies. Out of 13 people, three had to be women and one official had to be a woman. So that was the scope of the uh, CFA program. Uh, I'll focus on uh, how uh, this program uh, contributed to women empowerment and increased HLP rights uh, for women in the context of uh, uh, changing a land administration system and bringing in a new tenure and also new processes, very new, totally new to uh, the land administration system in Afghanistan. Uh, so I'll start with the participatory approaches to land administration services. Uh, we had a system uh, where uh, we involved the Goza assemblies I've mentioned before. So these are neighborhood committees or neighborhood councils. They were uh, totally involved in the whole process from survey to registration of uh, properties, including properties that are um, the households that are female headed and uh, the same as, uh, as houses, of course, that have uh, different uh, gender spouses. Uh, number two, the procedures for the occupancy, occupancy tenure. This is a new tenure, as I've said, uh, we called it occupancy or right to stay. Uh, not not ownership, uh, just uh, slightly less in terms of the bundle of rights to occupancy. A new tenure that was introduced actually into the law in Afghanistan for the first time. Uh, occupancy data is easily available uh, and disaggregated by gender, as you'll see later, I'll give an example. Uh, we had the opportunity to collect uh, property data and also occupancy data for almost 900,000 properties in eight cities in Afghanistan. Uh, women participate in this exercise, as you can see the top photo, uh, both as household heads or household uh, uh, household uh, members, but also sitting in the Goza assemblies that I talked about earlier. Next. Uh, so just to focus on the innovative approaches, the new things that we brought uh, into the land administration system in Afghanistan for the first time, uh, as I said earlier, the Goza assemblies. So these are assemblies that were formed in the context of this large national program that were used for many purposes, including participatory planning, but also used in uh, this land administration uh, process uh, of registration of informal uh, uh, properties. So women sat in the Goza assemblies, as you can see at the top, that is a registration a certificate with the officials of one Goza assembly. And as I said, one has to be a woman. And this, uh, this assembly is reg registered with the municipality and they act as, uh, as uh, land boards, if you like, in other countries, uh, they work as land boards. Second thing is uh, this occupancy certificate, which gives occupancy tenure. As I said, uh, the effect of this certificate is, uh, is a right to stay or a non-eviction right. Uh, for the first time in Afghanistan. And for the first time in Afghanistan, it's issued to women as joint occupants, but also as female heads of households. Uh, you can see in the bottom picture, uh, a woman head of a household being, give, being uh, issued with an occupancy certificate by uh, the then president uh, of Afghanistan. Next. Uh, so when uh, after two years, there was a proof of concept uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, process in the land administration system. Then we convinced uh, government at that time uh, to introduce policy and also an amendment to the land law to actually include uh, the new tenure and to include a regulation that allowed women as heads of household uh, to be presented with their own occupant certificates, but also spouses, women, uh, wife or wives to be included in the occupancy certificate as a spouse. On the right there, you see a photo of an occupancy certificate with a woman head of household. She, her picture is in the certificate. She's uh, issued with this certificate in her own right uh, for the first time in recent times in Afghanistan. So uh, the policy and, uh, and uh, land administration system elements that were brought in, 
uh, was the occupancy tenure, as I've said, that's the first bullet. The second is the parcels are registered jointly uh, uh, and issued in the husband and wife's names. Uh, third, women are registered as sole claimants, okay, if they are female-headed households, and also the new regulation that was uh, passed in 2018 uh, requires that survey data is uh, verified by the GOZA assemblies that I talked about later. In this case, they sit as what we call CTUs or uh, uh, cadastral territorial unit members uh, to listen to claims or disputes that arise from the surveying process. And they make decisions on that. And as I said, uh, three out of 13 at the very least uh, are mandated by the regulation to be women. Next. Uh, I just want to end with uh, some findings from this program. Uh, as I said, uh, we surveyed more than 900,000 properties. By the end of the project, we had registered 837,000 properties in, uh, in eight provinces. These are urban properties. You can see on the left, uh, the overall picture uh, in terms of uh, informality. Uh, out of more than 800,000 properties, 15% had formal documents. 49% uh, are customary, uh, 35 undocumented, etc. Uh, on the right side, you have the number of properties that are registered to female headed households. Overall, there were 5%. 5% of all the registered properties are female headed. But among the female headed properties, you can see that the ones who hold formal documents are already twice the overall number, 30%, uh, as, as compared to 15% in the overall number. Uh, you can see under undocumented, again, uh, much less than the overall number, which is okay, already a good trend. And uh, if uh, the results of this project are taken forward, uh, you, we, can, we think we can only build on this trend that you see uh, in this uh, slide. I'd like to end by saying uh, that the recommendations that I had from the Sudanese example give three recommendations, but two uh, reverberate very well with what we've seen in Afghanistan. The first one is legal reform. Uh, we've seen here that legal and policy reform actually works because most times it's officials uh, who create obstacles to access to women HLP rights. When there is uh, explicit mention in uh, legal documents, in statute, we find that there is a change and women can actually not only participate, but make decisions in the land administration process. Second uh, thing also suggested by, Sudan, by the Sudanese presentation is inclusion of women in customer institutions. In this case, we have women included in non-formal institutions that have been now put in the, in, the, in the regulations, and we've seen a change when women sit in these institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. These were a set of very highlighting presentations. Uh, in the sake of time, I'll hand over directly to our chair, Jim uh, Robinson, for the next uh, part of the program. Thanks, Ombretta, for guiding us through that section so uh, brilliantly. Thank you for that. Um, I, I want to just welcome uh, Jamal to uh, host our uh, Q&A um, moment. Um, we've had some great questions submitted in the chat. So Jamal, over to you for um uh, some uh, yeah response to those questions thank you very much jim and first of all i'd like to invite participants just give yourselves a virtual round of applause um, for being a part of the session and of course a virtual round of applause to our presenters today so so we started off with a very big question of why is it important to increase women's housing, land, and property rights in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. And of course, Umbretta got the ball rolling in that regard. And so far, we've received quite a number of questions um, in, in the chat function, using the chat function, and I see one hand raised. But before I get to that individual whose hand is raised, I like to um, share one of the first questions that was submitted, and that's by Jennifer Mbiti. And this question is directed towards um, Abdurrahman. And the question is, by registration of agricultural land, do you mean ownership? If so, how do you manage to register agricultural land, which is part of customary land that you mentioned is not covered under the constitution or by law? What is the legal backing for this process? 
in this case. So Abdurrahman, I'll hand that question over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kamal. I think it's a very valid question. And uh, initially in Sudan, we actually do agricultural land registration through two processes. First, we do the registration through the customary systems where the husband and the wife will get their consent jointly. And they fill a form called dispute free form where the land will be free of disputes. And then once that stage is finished, it actually goes through the legal registration, the formal registration. So we actually secure both social legitimacy aspect of the land rights from the customary institutions and the legal legitimacy part, which is through the legal system or the formal system. So it's a combination of both customary and the statutory systems that provide both social and legal legitimacy. Thank you. I think I have answered the question. Yes, thank you very much, Abdurrahman. And we have another um, participant here who has a question. Um, Galaxy A11 de Mosen, please take the floor. Okay, I see. Perhaps isn't ready just yet. So I'll alaykum. just. Okay, go right ahead. Go right ahead. مرحبا بكم وشكرا على دعوتكم اللطيفة للمشاركة في هذا في هذا الملتقى أنا من الجمهورية التونسية من ولاية سيدي بوزيد هل تسمعوني من ولاية سيدي بوزيد ورئيس جمعية الجمعية التونسية للوقاية من حوادث الطرقات وكما تعلمون أن ولاية سيدي بوزيد تقريبا لها طابع ريفي فلاحي أكثر ما هو متعارف عليه وحبيتنا الحق نعمل المداخلة هذه بالنسبة للمرأة الحق في السكن والأرض والممتلكات احنا في سيدي بوزيد في البل في الجمهورية كلها بصفة عامة أن ماذا بينا نعطوه الحق في الحياة أولا أن نحافظ عليها من ما هو ما هو موجود حاليا في خاصة في الولايات الريفية في الجمهورية التونسية من نقل عشوائي من كوارث يعني تصير في حوادث تزهق أرواح كثيرة بالسبب السبب الوحيد أن هن يعملنا يذهبنا من الصباح الباكر في يعني سيارة مفتوحة من الخلف ترفع تقريبا 30 إلى 35 امرأة يذهبون للعمل بدون أي تغطية اجتماعية بدون أي ضمان لحقهن لحق في الحياة و من أجل تفادي هذه هذه الكارثة ندعو وخاصة أن الملكية في الأرض والسكن تقريبا في تونس كاملة يعني مشتركة الملكية مشتركة يعني هنا أنبه وأؤكد أنه لازم لابد من اقتصاد تضامني تشاركي من أجل حماية هذه المرأة وتمكينها من التملك والعيش بسلام والحل الوحيد هو الاقتصاد التشاركي في خاصة في في ولايات سيدي بوزيد والولايات المجاورة الولايات الفلاحية التي بها يعني كل مقومات النجاح من أجل بعض بعض المشاريع واستقرارهن في أماكنهن في رغد من العيش وشكرا Yes, thank you very much. And just one more question as we are about to wrap up this segment. And this question is from Carol Boudreau, and it goes to any of the panelists. And the question is, how are you integrating concerns related to backlash against women who claim HLP rights? And what are the good practices to mitigate, if any? And of course, this goes to any of the panelists. Thank you, Jamal. Maybe I can answer that. Uh, uh, and, so and can you hear me? Great. So perhaps from no, the Syria perspective, from the Syria uh, crisis, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, the issue of GBV has been very prevalent, you know, in Syria and also in the host country. Uh, so really uh, is an issue across the region. NRC carried out uh, extensive research and we really seen a correlation between uh, the effort of a woman who's claiming HLP rights and then the perceived risk of violence that comes from the family, but also from uh, the society. And, and women interview, uh, especially in the uh, host country, reported rape, domestic violence, early and forced marriages, which are you know, increasing as a coping mechanism also due to the economic crisis, but also sexual exploitation and abuse. Now, of course, this is really difficult uh, situation um, and quite a lot of effort is required. Uh, and I think from our side, um, the one, I mean, we are trying to tackle this uh, in collaboration with other protection actors, for example, uh, GBV actors to whom we are uh, referring cases and we are working in close collaboration because, of course, uh, there's also an issue related to uh, social case management and not just legal case management. Uh, but we are um, consulting with women, refugee women, to understand what are the challenges, but also what measure we can put in place to protect their rights. Uh, uh, and, and also hearing from them themselves, what, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, how far can we push the envelope and what you know, becomes risky uh, to them? Because of course, this is a, an issue of perception of the risk, but there is a risk itself. And then also continue to provide access to uh, free legal assistance. So ensuring that uh, women are supported uh, and, but also are accompanied. So we're really uh, uh, giving them all the option, uh, but also listening to what they feel that, again, is uh, possible in the context where they find themselves. So really uh, um, working with them to understand how we can support them without putting them at further risk. And I think in the refugee response, um, women have feel empowered because, for instance, many Syrian women with whom uh, we, we deal on a daily basis are telling us that they are working for the very first time in their life. And so they are providing for their family and they are therefore no longer willing to you know, uh, follow some of the restricted norms that apply to them in Syria. But of course, we are again speaking about very, very sensitive issue. Uh, and, and I think here the answer is working with uh, you know, specialized GBV actors and other actors as well as uh, legal actors. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Um, it has been a very engaging session. I know that there are many, many more questions, but of course we'll see, we'll try our best to ensure that these questions are addressed over the course of the coming days and weeks. Umbretta's office will definitely coordinate that. So at this point in time, let me say thank you and I'll now hand over to Jim. Thanks, Jamal, and uh, thanks for, for chairing that, that part of our session. So I'm really pleased to welcome um, a colleague from uh, UNHCR, Mr. Sajad Malik, who's the Director of the Division of Resilience and Solutions with UNHCR to offer some closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Sajad Malik, the floor is yours. Jim, thanks, and, and thanks, Jamal. I was so in, engulfed in listening to all this conversation. Um, <clears throat> wish I would have joined earlier and listened more to it. Uh, but first of all, congratulations to all of you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big piece, um, you know, in this puzzle, which we've seen in many of these situations, conflict affected, but also now with the climate change, uh, other areas that are emerging, <clears throat> um, which requires a lot of um, effort in this particular area, housing, land, property issues. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in, in, in a number of conflict situations for a number of years now and seen it for first hand. Um, how it's, it's impacting communities, individuals, uh, especially women. Uh, when, you, when you see, and, and Laura just highlighted a few of those areas where I've been uh, over the last several years now, I just came out of, uh, <clears throat> of that situation. Um, and, and I can see that, that um, a lot of efforts have gone into it, but it also requires a lot of work. And I was so happy to see um, NRC, um, uh, UN Habitat, Global Land Tool Network, uh, the protection cluster AOR on HLP. Um, proud to see that UNHCR is, is part of that conversation, that it is becoming um, a very strong component of, of this discussion. 
without these areas uh, looked into, we are actually, you know, um, do a lot of work around self-sufficiency. We look for solutions, send people back home, communities return to their areas, but they return to very ambiguous situations. They, they, the land that they used to have is, is do not have access to that anymore, or the property that had, um, especially in, in, in buildings, which there are multiple houses in that, the ownership has always been um, rather unclear because the way of the taxation systems and all the other works, it really is a very complicated situation. And in most of these crisis conflict situations, which I've seen also firsthand, unfortunately, uh, male members of the family pass away in the conflict, and then the dependents and women are left uh, to, to look after that. And then the rights issues are absolutely the local laws and traditions are very complicated around that. Now, um, all this to say that this is a very complex environment, but your work here becomes very, very important. Um, and any discussion that you've had today, um, and I've just listened into the last bit of it. Um, while doing that, I also read your, your key messages and, and the notes there. I think it's a huge contribution. The work doesn't stop here. We need to continue working on that. I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of work that NRC has done over the years. Um, you and Habitat have done, all of you have worked on that, but I think this is something that brings together all of you in today's seminar, a huge success. I can see so many participants on, on the call. So thank you very much. Again, at least UNHCR side of it, we can commit to that this area is, is very important, uh, taking the work forward. Unfortunately, the displacement is increasing. If you look at the statistics over the last 10 years, it's doubled internal displacement, refugees, and with that, the displacement around climate, um, it's unfortunately going in the reverse direction and a lot of issues are emerging. So this piece that you've worked on is going to have an impact on individuals, families, communities out there who we are really uh, uh, need to always remain focused on. So no really big um, 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 speech to say thank you, but honestly appreciate the work that you have done. Jamal is here with you, and, and we are happy to have him uh, as an expert on UNHCR's team, which is good to, to reinforce the team with the housing land property expertise in the team, and, and we'll take this work forward with you on, on, on this area. So today, thank you very much to the speakers, to Jim, to you, to organize this, and all other colleagues who have taken part in that. So thank you very much, and more to discuss on this. This is a very complicated subject. We need to continue on this one. Thank you so much, Sajad, and it means a lot to have your words of support and encouragement there uh, from the UNHCR side, so we really welcome that. And um, I think the attendance and the engagement today shows the importance of these issues. I mean, it's great to see the engagement, though. It's also a sign that we have you know, so much work still to do and to keep doing, uh, trying to innovate and, and create better ways to respond. So thank you all so much for your engagement. We really want you to read the messages to let us know what you think. Um, both through the GLTN and, and through me at, at the HLP AOR. We'd love to have uh, more of your comments and there's some great questions there in the chat. Um, and I'll just um, highlight again, we, we released a, a special edition of our global update on HLP that was focused on uh, displaced women's uh, HLP rights. So I'm just going to put a link to that in the chat because it mentions these key messages as well as some other um, uh, interesting articles on, on this issue. But just want to say thank you so much to uh, Ombreta, Eleanor and Fatih is the, the team who've been organizing behind the scenes and it's been great to work with you Jamal as well and other colleagues who have presented here today. Thank you so much. Um, I think this is a conversation we need to continue and I'm sure we will be organizing uh, future ways to discuss and share examples and it'd be great to come back and hear more how these uh, projects and examples today that we've heard are, are developing. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and uh, Yes, look forward to continuing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you everyone. Thank you, everybody. All the best.